Thanks for tuning in to this week's message. If you'd like to know more about what's going on at Connections Church, you can find us at connectionschurch.church or look us up on Facebook and Instagram. What a fantastic opportunity we've already had this morning to just worship. Amen? I'll tell you what, I, I enjoy being with you folks. There's just no better place that I could think of to be any morning, but especially on a Sunday morning than with you. And like I said, I was, I was walking around right back here while we were singing that first and second song, and, and, and some of you are just going after God. And I just appreciate that so much, and it makes me want to go after God. And we, that's how it spreads from one person to another. Are you glad you're here? Amen. Fantastic. We are, we are excited about this morning. Today we wrap up this month-long study that we've been on called The Real Jesus. And I know this, I want to know the real Jesus. How about you? Man, I, I want to know Him. I don't want to just know about Him. I don't want a head knowledge of Jesus. I want to know who He is. And here's the cool thing that we know about Jesus. And if you don't know this, I might be telling you this for the first time this morning, I want you to know, He wants to know you. And that's different than any other religion or, 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 or belief system that you could possibly be involved in or, or, or chase. This Jesus, the real Jesus, wants to know you. And so it's a reciprocating type thing. And, and, and so it's not the misidentified Jesus that we talked about on week one. It's not the misquoted Jesus that we talked about in, in week two. It's not the misunderstood Jesus that we talked about last week. I want to know the real Jesus. And if you missed any of these messages in this series, go back on our website, find those podcasts, check those out so that you can be caught up with, with where we're at this morning. So our last installment then today will deal with this, the misrepresented Jesus. And if you've got your outlines, just go ahead and flip those over so you can take some notes on the back of that. And if you've got your Bibles this morning, and I'm a little bit old fashioned, so I'm just going to ask, who's got their Bible this morning? Electronic versions count. Go ahead. Yeah. If you've got your Bibles this morning, go ahead and open those up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll give you a little preview of where we're going to be right there. And get ready. That's all I've got to tell you. Get ready this morning for what God has for you. The misrepresented Jesus. And there's plenty of that going on in our culture and in our world. Amen. People misrepresenting who Jesus really is. We believe that misrepresenting Jesus and who He is, who he, who he truly is, what He said, what He stands for, is one of the biggest problems that we face in the church today. Misrepresenting. Not fully understanding and articulating, but misrepresenting who He, who he is. There's far too many churches, far too many Christian leaders who aren't presenting Jesus Christ with the facts and the correct interpretation as, as the Word tells us to do, to divide, rightly divide the Word, understand, and then represent <clears throat> Jesus the right way. So it's the misinterpretation of Scripture that has led to this. But instead of proclaiming a false gospel and a, and a false Jesus based on selfishness and a, and a desire to, to tickle the ears of those who will listen, we're not about that at Connections Church. I'm just telling you now this morning, I didn't come to tickle your ears. I didn't come to tell you what you wanted to hear this morning. Are you glad you came now? Amen. I came to re represent Jesus Christ, who He is, not who we want Him to be. Several men were at a local golf club. They were, they were in the locker room, and a cell phone begins to, to ring on a bench, and one of the men engages the hands-free speaker function on the cell phone. All the other men in the room get quiet so that they can listen to the conversation. The man who engaged the hands-free says, hello. And a woman on the other end of the phone says, hi, honey, it's me. Are you at the club? The man replies, I am. I'm at the shops now, she said, and I found this beautiful leather coat. It's, it's only $2,000. Hard to find one like it anywhere. Is it okay if I buy it? Sure, he said. Go ahead. If you like it that much, Go ahead and get it. She continued, I also stopped by the Mercedes dealership and I saw the new models. I saw one that I, I really liked. He said, how much? She said, it's only $200,000. He said, all right, 
But for that price, make sure it comes with all the options. She said, great. One more thing. I I was talking to Janie. Uh, She found out that the house that I wanted last year is back on the market, and they're only asking $2.2 million. He responded, well, we'll go ahead and offer $2 million. They'll probably take it. If not, go in the extra $200,000. Isn't that bad if it's really what you want? She responded, okay, I'll see you later. I love you. And the man said, okay, sure enough. And looking around at the other men awkwardly said, I love you too. And the man hung up the phone. The other men in the locker room were standing there in complete amazement with their their jaws dropped to the floor at the the man in the conversation that had just happened. And then the man who had answered the phone picks up the phone and turns around and says, does anybody know who this cell phone belongs to? (laughs) See, misrepresenting yourself can be dangerous. It, it, It can be deadly at times. We We've all heard of cases where people have misrepresented themselves. A quick search on the internet this weekend yielded no less than four current news stories of people who have pretended misrepresented themselves to be law enforcement officers. Has anybody in the room ever done that? Don't raise your hand. Seems like it's a common thing for people to do. There's scams that plague our society. Some of us have fallen victim to those where people pretend to be collecting money for worthy causes like benevolence funds or, or, or local volunteer fire departments or rescue departments only to find out that they're liars and they're thieves. And once you give them your credit card number or they come by and pick up a check, it's gone to their pocket, not to the fund that you thought. We've had cases of misrepresented IRS agents calling to make a deal with you that if you'll pay now by credit card, we'll cut off 50 to 75% of what you owe, only to realize the IRS is still calling and you got bilked out of that money that you had earned. I saw an actual court case, this blew my mind this week, where a person or people have pretended to be doctors, dentists, and even surgeons and gotten away with it for a period of, bata- of time. It's unbelievable what people will misrepresent themselves to do and get away with in our society. So as we finish up our study this morning on the real Jesus, and this is for everyone, by the way, who calls themselves a Christ follower, a Christian We need to understand that who he is and not misrepresent him in any way, shape, or form. We don't want to misrepresent the gospel. We don't want to misrepresent the message that he brings. So, So here it is. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You've got your Bibles there. Verses 17 through 20. And it says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... Like I said, it's for Christians, for Christ followers. He is a new creation. Isn't that good news this morning? Even if we stopped right there, and I kind of feel like preaching right there. We may not get any further. If we stopped right there and just grasped the fact that we are new creations in Christ Jesus, we could just go home happy at that point, could we not? Man, We're new creations. It says the old things have passed away. Thank God for that. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Some of us are yet to get that. Amen? But but we have it. We just have to utilize it. The ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's you and me. That's where we come in. He reconciled us to himself or the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then... We are ambassadors for Christ. I want you to highlight that, underline that, circle that, write that on your hand, whatever it takes. We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I want you to get that this morning. That you are an ambassador to Christ. 
Our job is to be those ambassadors. Our job is to go out and, as this scripture says, implore people. Let me ask you what you think the word implore implies. Does it imply that you just casually live the Christian life in front of people and hope that they see Jesus in you? Yes or no? Do you think that imploring means that you just show up for church on Sunday and you think maybe and hope that they'll see your car in the parking lot and ask you, hey, I saw your car over in the parking lot at church at Connections on Sunday. What's going on in there? That doesn't sound like imploring to me. Imploring, I get this visual, this picture in my mind of the kind of the language that Paul used in the book of Galatians where he was talking about the fact that we need to be zealous for God, that we need to be zealous in our duties to Jesus. And, and that's what this is, is that we are supposed to be ambassadors. We're supposed to be imploring people on whose behalf? Christ's behalf. To come and be reconciled to God. What does that mean? That means to have their sins forgiven. That means to get things straight. That means to get back to what God had fully intended in the beginning, way before Adam and Eve let us down. Reconciliation. Have you ever had a relationship in your personal life on the horizontal level I'm talking about right now, and it just wasn't going good, and there had to be reconciliation. We've all had that. There, there had to be a time where the, the two parties sat down, or maybe it was a whole family. He had to sit down, call a family meeting, and say, we need reconciliation here. We can't move forward until we come to a conclusion on what the problem is. So, we have to be reconciled. That's number one on your outline this morning, if you're going to fill in the blanks. We get our ID our identification, our ID from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 20. So what is, the question is, an ambassador? Some of us are maybe not getting that this morning. Like, what, what is an ambassador? We, we may have heard about ambassadors on the news or ambassador ships, and we've got people who the president appoints to go and be ambassadors to different countries. And what do they do? What does this mean? What is it that it means for me to be an ambassador? Check this out. When all else fails, and we've, we've gone to Scripture, and we hear what it says, we're to be an ambassador and be out imploring people to be reconciled to God, then we have to go to the second best source of all information, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. Of course. What is an ambassador? This is awesome. This is, I'm in a good mood this morning, by the way. It, this is good stuff, in case you hadn't figured it out yet. Look, here's what Merriam-Webster's Dictionary says for the word ambassador. I love this. A diplomatic agent of the highest rank accredited to a foreign government or sovereign as the resident representative of his or her own government or sovereign or appointed for a special and often temporary diplomatic assignment. That's a mouthful, but check it out. There's a gospel message right there in Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. First of all, it says that we're an agent. If you're going to be an ambassador, you have to be an agent. How do you become an ambassador? You have to be appointed. It's right there in the, in the definition. To be appointed to the highest rank accredited by the government or the agency or the sovereign. Are y'all getting this this morning? You and I, all of us in this room, those of you watching on the internet, those of you who will hear this or watch this podcast, you've been assigned. You're an agent. God has pointed you out. There's a whole message on being called right there that I would love to get into. Have y'all got about three hours? You're an agent. God said, you know what? I want you. You remember the old posters of Uncle Sam, the old you? Some of you too young in the room and never seen such a thing. But we want you. They were talking about wanting you to come and, and, and enlist and serve in the, in the military services. And thank God for that. But, but this is even higher purpose than that. Even the definition in Merriam-Webster says it's, it's a diplomatic agent of the highest rank. You don't get to be down here anymore. And some of you that know me know, if you put me in the highest rank, I'm going to start to show something. Right? And that's how I feel this morning. And I want you to feel that. Is, is God looked at you in your circumstances, in the place you are right now. You say, well, Pastor, I, I got some things I got to work through. I got to get out of this. I can't be in the highest rank right now. Phooey on that. 
You're in the highest ranking diplomatic position in God's kingdom right now. Somebody ought to say amen to that. Why? Because God decided that that would be your position. That's what the word ambassador means. It means that you're going to do that. And I love this part of the definition right here. Don't miss this. You've been appointed for a special and often temporary diplomatic assignment. Thank God this morning it's temporary. Amen? Because some of us ambassadors are going through some stuff and we're thinking, man, if this is the way it's going to be, I, I, I don't know if I want to stay in this. I don't, I don't know if this is for me. Hey, listen, it's temporary. And the assignment is temporary. Do you know why the assignment is temp? I'm getting ready to tell you something right here. Do you know why the assignment is temporary? Because Jesus is coming back. He's going to call his church home. And as we read through Scripture in Matthew and chapter 25 and in Revelation, we see the unfolding of the end times. We see the setting up of the kingdom of heaven. And I'm going to ask you this. I just thought of this. I didn't even think of this last night, Eric. If I'm an ambassador of the highest rank here, what am I going to be when I get there? Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to be a son of the most high God. I, I, I'm going to be on top of the world. It would it, it, mean nothing to be a, an ambassador here. But while I'm here, I'm an ambassador of the most high God. Let me give you the simple definition. This is number two listed in the dictionary. Are y'all okay? I ain't lost you, have I? Am I going over time? I got to leave P-Rob a little bit of time here. This one's a little more simple. I'm an authorized representative or messenger. I'm authorized. What am I authorized to do? I'm authorized to, as Christ's ambassador, I'm talking about you, I'm talking about me, I'm of the highest rank, I am authorized and appointed for this special time in this special assignment to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to everybody that I know and everybody that I can possibly get to. That's an ambassador. That's what I'm appointed to. So even if we go to the the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, I can get you guys excited. I just now learned that, P-Rob. That's all we got to do is just go to the dictionary. Appointed. We're ambassadors of Jesus himself and the kingdom that he will set up on this earth. I don't know where you are this morning in your thinking and and in your spirit this morning and in your walk with Christ. But I know this, if we would look at ourselves as James asks us to do in his writing, in the mirror every morning, after we've shaved, gentlemen, preferably, after we've brushed our teeth so our breath is a little fresher than it was, after we've put on the dog, so to speak, if we would look at ourselves in the mirror and remind ourselves convince ourselves. Paul writes in Scripture, convince yourself. I am convinced, he said. Do you, how, how do you think he got convinced? Paul got up every morning, brushed his teeth, looked in the mirror and said, I'm an ambassador of Christ. You say, what Scripture is that? I can't point you to it. I just think that's what Paul did. That's what we need to be doing. We need to get up every morning and look in the mirror and say, you know what? I don't know. It's, it's, it's going to be a good day. You know why? Because you Looking in the mirror. You, buddy, you're an ambassador of Christ. It's your job today to carry the message of Jesus Christ. It's your job to go give hope to the world. So instead of waking up in that fog in an unmotivated way, riding our last nerve, those people at work, we're thinking on while we're looking in the mirror, I can't wait to get there. I'm going to cuss somebody out today. No, listen, I'm an ambassador. I'm an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Christ. So here's the big question for you. How's that going? Ugh. How's that going? You've been an ambassador. You didn't just get called to do that today. How's the, your ambassadorship going? As Jesus ambassadors, Christians, we, you and I, have been set apart to faithfully mirror Him in our neighborhoods, our places of work and play, our realms of influence. Therefore, our calling is to labor in every way possible. Did you hear that word labor in there? Labor. 
labor in every way possible to model our ministry, his ministry, and his message to everybody that we run into. Or to live to, to, to live as those who are full of grace and truth. That's what your ambassadorship should stand for. That, that's your motto, full of grace and truth. Let's print some t-shirts. We wear a t-shirt for everything else. John Deere. I got my John Deere. Proud of it. Let's print shirts that say, ambassadors of Christ, full of grace and truth. How many people you think would come up and knock on you? Well, I guess touch you on the arm. And, and, and ask you, what's that all about? You're an ambassador to Christ. We're to live as those who are full of grace and truth, whose churches and ministries, because we're walking in the path of Jesus, will attract all types of people who are attracted to Him. Did you realize we're supposed to be attractive? You guys really are. Everybody here just really attractive. You got up this morning, you, you, you look great. But our ministry, our ambassadorship is also supposed to be attractive. And along the way, we're going to draw some criticism, right? We're going to draw some criticism from, from the types of people who criticize Jesus. We've seen that in Scripture. He was criticized. He, he was beaten. So we've seen and heard of big names in ministry, right? Uh, terrible times that have misrepresented Jesus and Christianity. You remember some of those names. The Jims, Jim Baker, Jim Swagger, Jim Jones, just to name a few. I'm glad our pastor's name's not Jim, aren't you? <laughs> People who have, have misrepresented Christ at times in their ministry. And then we got hate groups and, and people who have a, a one-track mind on things that call themselves Christian organizations at times, but, but yet they, they hate people. How can that be? They hate people because of their nationality or their skin color, but they call themselves Christians. How does that work? They're misrepresenting Jesus. But those aren't the only folks who have misrepresented Jesus. There's plenty of us. Amen? We might as well admit it. There's plenty of us who are regular 9 to 5 working, I love Jesus t-shirt, wearing fish symbol on your bumper sticker, WWJD band wearing Christians who are way out in left field with the way that we've represented Jesus. Folks, you can tell Scott's excited this morning. He, his voice has reached that puberty level where it's like way up in the rafters, man. I tell you, he was getting it today. Thank you, buddy. Uh, and, and, and he's right on the money. This is a, a critical area. And the reality is, as he just left us, none of us are going to bat a thousand. None of us are going to get this right all the time. Uh, however, that's not reason for us to just kind of settle with the fact that, well, we're going to blow it. You know, we're not always going to be a, a perfect representation of Jesus Christ to those around us. So I'm just going to kind of give in to that, that, that thought process and, and that reality, and I'm just going to kind of settle for being mediocre. We don't settle, church. We're not called to be settlers, amen? Because <laughs> we're on a journey. We're traveling through this world to get home, as Pastor Scott's already mentioned, and we're going to do that as ambassadors, as royal ambassadors of the king. And now my, my voice is getting a little high, but that's okay. We are royal ambassadors. Now, we know there, there have been plenty of people come along the line, as, as Scott pointed out, just a few of them, that, that I don't necessarily think those couple few, maybe one of them did, had bad intentions from the beginning, but I think people get off track. But there are times when people do just come in with the wrong intentions in mind. They are schemers. They are scammers. They are people that are intentionally looking to make a dollar and to, to benefit themselves by using the name of Christ. And, and that's their motives. That's their agenda. That's the whole reason they come up with the, the plan, so to speak. But here's what I want to say to all of us right now. I don't think I'm talking to anybody like that. What I think we're talking to this morning are a group of people in this room, outside of this room, that your heart is, man, I, I love Jesus. Maybe I don't walk with him or know him that well, but, but I'm, I'm at least curious about him. I'm, I'm intrigued by who he is. And, and yet you may be in here and you've loved Jesus and you've walked with him faithfully for 25, 35, 45, 150 years in Don's case. I don't know. But I think in your heart of hearts, just like me, man, I love Jesus. He first loved me. He gave himself for me. I mean, he died in my place. And I want to get this right. And it's tough to do at times. It's challenging. 
I want to honor him. I want to be a, a true testimony to who and what Jesus really is. I want to help people get it right. How do I do that? I think number two in your outline is that we must address the barriers that are there, that, that many of them are, are created by us, unfortunately, barriers that have hidden the real Jesus from the world. You may have heard this statement. Gandhi, the great guru, was asked at one point in time why he never became a Christian. He was a very spiritual person, but he missed the whole point because he missed Christ in that relationship. And, and here's what his answer was. Now, the question again was, why did you not become a Christ follower? And here's his answer. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. And he went on to explain, your Christians are so unlike your Christ. He had an admiration for Jesus, but he could not reconcile how Christians were such poor representatives of their master. In his mind, this is what kept him from surrendering his life to Jesus Christ. We are literally to be copies of our king. You know, write that down on your outline somewhere. We are to live as copies of the king. We are to eat, sleep, and breathe as Jesus would, so to speak. We are to exist and to live and to move and interact. And, and everything about us should represent Christ in our lives. If we're serious about being Jesus' ambassadors, we need to listen very carefully to statements like the one I just read. We've got to examine the most common barriers that stand between the real Jesus and people's false impressions of Him. Impressions which unfortunately have been projected to a watching world by many sincere, yet many misguided Christ followers. I listed on your outline just some ways that that we get the opportunity to be seen by people, to, to have people witness our lives and, and what's at stake there and, and how that can go. And the first one is simply by our actions. That's, that's the first thing you need to fill in in that section, actions. Because we all know the old adage that goes, actions speak louder than what? Than words. I mean, we've, we've talked about that numerous times with our children. They are going to mimic what we do. Not what we get in front of them and shake our fingers in their faces and tell them they need to do. They're going to watch our lives and they're going to model their lives after us. Here's the reality. The, the watching world around us that we do life in, they are watching us closely. If we raise the flag of Christianity in our lives and claim to be following Him, then they're going to have a set of eyes on us that are going to be locked in just to see if we're living out what we're talking. So our actions are either going to make or break. We're going to be true to our words or not by what we do. Secondly, is our attitudes. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul wrote these words. He said, we must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus has. I mean, that is putting it bluntly. It's all about the attitude. That's where it starts. Many of you woke up this morning and maybe you didn't get to go eat at your favorite restaurant last night. Maybe you didn't get to go do the fun stuff you wanted to do yesterday. Maybe you didn't have the weekend that you thought you were going to have uh, uh, yesterday and Friday night. And so you come to Sunday morning and now you're thinking, man, now they want me to get up and go to church. Boy, this weekend's really going downhill. And so you got up with a bad attitude. And you know what? That's your choice. But I don't know about you, but when I got up, I said, this is a day that... The Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. And when I walked outside, man, there's something about being outside on a beautiful day like we, we have today and, and have had for the last several weeks. Something about walking outside and looking up. That's where your perspective comes from, looking up. Looking up and seeing the beauty of the sky and the heavens that God created. And then taking a quick glance around you or maybe linger a little bit. And seeing the trees and nature and the flowers and the beauty and, and seeing a squirrel run by and, and maybe a deer or whatever it is. And, and you just knowing that God did all that. It does something to your attitude. And I'm telling you, you can walk around with sunshine coming out your rear end and have the best day you've ever had. Why? Because you got your attitude right. And man, let me tell you something. People notice. They notice when your attitude's great and they notice when your attitude stinks. And the Bible plainly tells us, Paul wrote, here's a, a prescription for you. Let the attitude in you be the same attitude that was in Christ. Don't get no better than that like we say around here. 
The next thing is our words. Colossians 4, 6 tells us this. Let your conversation be always full of grace. There's those t-shirts again, Pete Scott. And seasoned with salt. Maybe we had that somewhere on the back. Salty saints, I don't know. So that you may know how to answer everyone who asks you, what's going on in your life? Well, let me tell you. If you don't know him, his name is Jesus. And if you don't know him, he will rock your world. You'll never be the same. Ephesians 4, 29 goes on and tells us these powerful words. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth. Man, unwholesome, that's a lot of stuff that fits in that suitcase, right? There's a lot of things that that go into that category. We're not talking just about curse words. We're talking about words that damage and words that tear others down and rumors and, and all that kind of junk. And here Paul is saying, don't let any unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, for building up, for encouragement, for lifting others, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace, there's that word again, to those who hear. Words are powerful. Our prayer should be constantly, God set a guard over our mouths. And we should add on to that, God set a guard over our fingers so that we don't type and send or post something stupid. There's a lot of people that just, if it comes into mind, it's out the mouth before they even filter it anywhere. And they're saying it or they're posting it. And man, not only are they bringing damage to the kingdom of Christ if they claim to be Christ followers and ambassadors, but they're making themselves look foolish simply. We don't talk like that. Would you turn to somebody and just tell them that? We are not to talk like that. And then turn back and say, you understand that? I mean, get in her face a little bit if you have to. Travis was leading our service team this morning, and in the meeting he said, here's the knife hand, and I'm using it for this entire pre-service meeting so everybody understands what we're saying. Maybe you need to break out the knife hand. I don't know. We don't talk like that. What about character and integrity? That's the next one on your outline. They speak for themselves. Christ followers should lead the way in these as Jesus was perfect in his character and integrity. Always did the right thing and never ever lied. And he lives in us as Christians. So it makes sense if he lives in us, we should be people of character and integrity. Let our yes be yes, our no be no. And whenever we say something, you can count on it. And we're not going to be living a double life, doing one thing in public and something else behind the scenes. And what about love? The Bible says, if we don't have love for others, we don't really have God living in and leading our lives. Here's the the beauty of this. Love is the litmus test. Jesus said, how could you say you love God, your Father, and yet you hate another person that's made in the image of God, your Father? It's all about love. Love encompasses everything. Love is God, and God is love. And he says, if you are going to be an ambassador of mine, that love needs to ooze out of every pore of your being. And I don't care what they've done to you. Love, 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 and service. Jesus himself said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for you. Got a question for you. Are you better than Jesus? (laughs) No, we're not, but we're called to be just like him. And I guarantee you that if you truly give yourself to serving others in Christ, and you do it for the glory of God and his great kingdom, you're going to find a joy like no other, and you're going to find true fulfillment. I'm going to tell you, man, people search and search and search, wanting something that will fill that void in their lives. And here's the answer. Loving Jesus, serving him, and serving others in him. There it is. We put a lot of psychiatrists out of business that way. A lot of counselors out of business with the reality of people that just get a hold of it. It's all about serving Christ and serving others through Him. That'll give you joy and fulfillment beyond anything you've ever dreamed about. And next, what about passion for Christ? These should mark our lives. We say we love Jesus and yet we're empty and, and passionless. We're void of any emotion. What, what, what season are we in right now? Now, I know some of you rednecks out there, but we're in hunting season. I'm ready, baby. Woo! And so you're passionate about that. No offense, Eric. I'm a redneck too. I, I, I fessed up that long ago. We're in NFL football season right now. 
I mean, there are people that are already in church right now because they're out tailgating. <laughs> Waiting for the big game, baby. Got my barbecue cooker going. Got my munchies. Got my sun drops. That's the strongest thing you need to drink. <laughs> Woo! Got my face all painted up. Got my shirt on. Got my helmet right there on the dashboard. Go Panthers. Right, John? <laughs> no way. How they got you there last week, we still don't understand that. But dolphins, right? Woo! Go fish. You talk about some of the most passionate people in the world. It's these crazy NFL football fans, right? So, does it not make sense that we should get more passionate, more excited, more pumped up, more radical, more banner-waving, more worship, more everything for Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords? I know we use that example a lot, but the reality is of it, we don't, must not, something's not clicking. Because many times we come into our church and we're dead and we're dry. And we're on empty and we're not showing that passion. I'm talking about the break the jar kind of passion that, that Mary had when she came into the room and Jesus was there. And she broke that expensive bottle of perfume and she poured it on him. And she fell at his feet and she worshiped and she cried and she, she wept in front of her king, her savior. Passion should mark our lives as ambassadors for Christ. And I've heard it for 30-something years. Well, that's just my, my personality, Pastor. And I understand that. But you'll be amazed at what can happen when you kind of step out of yourself. And step in to the anointing. Step out of yourself and step into the presence of the King. All of a sudden, here's what happens. It's not about you anymore. You have disappeared. <laughs> And the king of glory has invaded you and who you are. And that thing that used to be you is dying to self. And what's being raised to life is the glory of the living God that just as Pastor Scott mentioned one day is going to come back and he's going to take us home to be with him. Those of us who were longing for his appearance. Not just every once in a while thinking, well, Jesus might come back this week. They're saying that all this is happening in the solar system. There's earthquakes going on in Mexico. Man, there's like 40,000 hurricanes happening in the Atlantic. And, you know, all hell's breaking loose. And we've had eclipses and everything else. And so Jesus, no, I'm not talking about that stuff. That's what the world does. They try to figure and calculate and pinpoint and, and nail down, well, I think he's going to come here. But it's not about passion for them. It's not about that longing to see him and just can't wait till he gets here and takes us to that place that he's preparing for us. We've got to have that passion. We've also got to have our stuff right, our doctrines and our beliefs. His word. We've got to be on point in both knowing God's word and sharing God's word, rightly dividing the word of truth as Paul wrote, not picking and choosing or taking verses out of context or adding to it or taking things out that we don't like. It's not a buffet. It's all good and it's all for us and it's not all easy to adhere to and follow and surrender to and say yes to. But you know what? The truth is the truth and the truth shall set you free. The truth came to set us free. Jesus incarnate was the word become flesh. And when he left to go be with the Father, he sent down the Holy Spirit that, that would illuminate the word of God that was written to every single one of us in humanity for our freedom, for our salvation, for our hope, for our wholeness, for our everything that we desperately have need of. And we've got to know the word so we can share the word. We've got to know the word so we can live it out correctly. Because if I get the instructions wrong, you ever try to put one of those assembly things together for your kids at Christmas, man, you're up, it's Christmas Eve, it's about two in the morning, kids have been jacked up on candy and, and, and just excited about Santa, you couldn't get them in bed, and you finally got them to sleep, and you open up that box, and it's like there's 37 pages of instructions to put that together, and you're like, man, I'm just going to skip that, kind of do it the way it looks like it needs to go, and it's all jacked up. Or you try to read those instructions, and man, you are like just so tired you, you you're like hallucinating is that Santa really did I just hear rain here on the roof man I gotta get some sleep it's been four days since I've slept so you're not getting the directions right man we've got to get it right we've got to know 
the word. And finally, what about our motives? The only thing I'm going to say in that is we can do the right things for the wrong reasons. And that's exactly what Jesus kept calling out the Pharisees and religious leaders on. Man, you're out there praying on the straight street corner. Prayer, prayer's good. Prayer's communicating with God. It's, it's sharing our heart with Him and, and having Him share His heart with us in a personal relationship. It's, it's conversations with God. And that's good, and that's what we all need to be about because He is our, our Savior, our Lord, our God, our King, and we want to know Him, and, and, and we just need that. However, they were praying out on the street corners with their long flowing robes, with their elaborate words they were using, and, and they were doing it not, not to, to be in relationship with God. They were doing it to be seen by people and have those people look at them and think, wow, man, that's a spiritual dude right there. He's way above me. L- listen to what words he's using. Man, he must have been to seminary. Check those words. I don't even know what they mean. I can't even pronounce half of them. It was all about motive. I'm going to tell you something. Some, lots of times we can hide our motives from those around us. And I debated to put this one on the list or not. But the reality is we can never hide our motives from God. He always knows if we're promoting self or we're promoting him. He always knows what's going on deep in here when nobody else does. So everything, all of these things have to be right. And you say, man, pastor, that's awesome. That's what I want. I want to have that. But that's a tall order. So in the next two minutes, I want to just give you how we get that, how, how we get it right. The last thing on your outline there, I believe the answer for us is found in Galatians 5, through 23, that tells us this. Paul again wrote these words, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Let me just kind of translate for us. In other words, get these fully functioning in and through us, and we truly represent Jesus. Bam, bottom line. If we can get the fruit of the Holy Spirit, these nine things that sum up the attributes of a Christ follower, going strong in our lives, then we represent Christ effectively and correctly. We get the Holy Spirit We should have all the fruit developing within us, growing stronger within us. Folks, the fruit of the Spirit empowers us to get it right. We must be like Jesus in being Spirit-filled and Spirit-led. And when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, He's going to produce all of these attributes, the attributes of Christ in abundance in us and through us. We will be fruitful representatives of Jesus to our world around us. Now, you're saying yes, but how does that happen? Uh, Okay, that's the answer. I need the fruit of the Spirit. How does that happen? How do I get that? How do I live full of the Holy Spirit, bearing His fruit, living in His power? Two keys. Number one, ask the Lord to fill you with His Spirit. And when we're talking about filling, we're not just talking about taking a vessel and pouring uh, from another vessel in or or, or putting another spigot until it's it's all the way full right up to the rim with brim and, and, and you couldn't get no more and that's it. You cut it off. No. It's a continual filling. You just keep the spigot on. You just keep it under there. It just keeps filling and pouring out over it. So you're, you're always completely full to, to the point that you're just spilling out on others around you. Don't you want to spill out on others around you? Love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, self-control. Self-control is a big one. Don't you want to have that? Then ask the Lord to fill you. And then lastly, yield to His Lordship and His leadership. So as you bow your heads and close your eyes right now, I ask you this question. If you are a Christian in this room right now or outside of this room and you're watching or listening, what kind of representative of Christ are you? How's that been going for you? How are you doing with that? I mean, if, if, if someone were to evaluate you that knows you intimately and deeply, what would their eva- evaluation look like at the end of the day? But if you know in your own heart, if the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you, been been knocking on your door saying, you know what, some of these things aren't right. Your actions may be a little bit off here. Your attitudes aren't, aren't, aren't quite measuring up to Christ's attitude. I don't know what it is, but something inside you or outside of you or, or going on with you is not where it should be. So here's what I'm asking with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If you're in here, you would honestly say, you know what, pastor, that's me. I've struggled here. I've struggled there. I've struggled with, with this area or whatever it may be. And God, through his Holy Spirit this morning, has spoken to my heart that that needs to to change. Would you just raise your hand right now? I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who else in here is saying, man, I'm I'm struggling in this way. And 
the Lord's knocking on my door and, and he needs to come. Maybe it's the words you speak. I don't know. I, I, I'm just saying, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. Anybody else? Maybe your motives, maybe your character and integrity. I don't know. But here's what I want to do. If you raise your hand, would you just stand all across this room? I'm not going to call you up front, but I want you to stand where you're at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Maybe you need to raise your hand. Thank you. You didn't, but just stand on up anyway. Just cut, cut that, that part out. Maybe you're in here and you say, you know what, Pastor? I truly need Jesus to come and save me, to be Lord of my life, to, to put His Holy Spirit inside of me, to produce those fruit. I, I, I want to know Him. Anybody that's going to give their life for me, anybody that loves me that much, anybody that does all that He's done and continues to do, I want to surrender my everything to Him and know Him as my Lord and Savior. Would you just stand up with these many that are standing right now across this room? Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Anybody else? Just stand up right now. Join these. Thank you. Thank you. Now here's what I want to do. I want everyone to stand up across this room because I honestly believe that we could all use a little help or maybe a lot of help in these areas that we've identified as being a part of being a royal ambassador for Christ. So I just want to pray over all of us. Would you take the hand of whoever is nearby you right now? Whether you stood in the first call, stood in the second call, or stood at the last call. You're standing right now, and, and Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for giving us this high calling to ambassadorship, Lord, that you've appointed us, as Scott shared with us. What an amazing, mind-boggling thing that is that you entrusted us that much to represent the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, God. And Lord, we cry out as a collective body, forgive us for failing in that area so many times. But we also cry out, God, along with repentance, help us. Help us to grow strong. Help us to represent you. Help us to be all that you have called and created us to be, God. We surrender once again to you, Jesus. Whether there's been people in here serving Christ for 50 years or today they're saying, I need Jesus. And they're making that surrender in, in their hearts now, God. We cry out to you to come and redeem us, God, and renew us and revive us as the people of God that we would live lives worthy of this high calling. Let it be, Lord. Infuse us with passion today as we finish a time of worship in song, God. Let a song rise up within us. Let us step out of ourselves and into the presence and the glory of our King as we celebrate you today, Father. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said together, amen and amen. Let's worship Him, church. Thanks for tuning in to this week's message. If you'd like to know more about what's going on at Connections Church, you can find us at connectionschurch.church or look us up on Facebook and Instagram.